Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Books and Books. Thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful Friday evening. Uh, before we get started, uh, just to give you a heads up, take a look at our Books and Books uh, newsletter. This will give you a rundown of all the wonderful events we have here at Books and Books. Uh, a couple of note uh, I'd like to mention for you. Uh, celebrity autographing with CeeLo Green will take place here tomorrow in the store at 2 o'clock. We've got Nelson DeMille will be joining us next week. Uh, interview with Salman Rushdie at the Wolfson campus downtown Miami-Dade. And even Nicholas Sparks will be here at the end of the week, so, or excuse me, at the end of the month. So you can buy tickets for any of these events or see us about getting one of these newsletters. Also, don't forget, give us your email address so we can send you some emails and let you know. Also, as we told you before, we are live streaming this event tonight uh, on the internet. You can call the store, order a book. We'll have these two wonderful gentlemen sign a copy for you, and uh, we can ship it to your home. We can uh, bring it to your house. I'll deliver it personally, however you want to do it. We can do it for you here at Books and Books. But tonight is a very special event. We're very pleased to have with us uh, John Searles and uh, Chris Bohalian back with us. Uh, author John Searles is the author of the national bestsellers Boy Still Missing and Strange But True. He frequently appears as a book critic for NBC's Today Show and CBS's The Early Show. He's the editor-at-large of Cosmopolitan. His essays have been published in the New York Times, Washington Post, and other national newspapers and magazines. Chris Bajalian is the ac critically acclaimed author of 16 books, including the New York Times bestsellers The Sandcastle Girls, Skeletons at the Feast, The Double Bind, and Midwives. His novel Midwives was a number one New York Times bestseller and a selection of Oprah's book club. His work has been translated into more than 25 languages, and three of his novels have been made into movies. So here they are in conversation for the first time together again, Chris Bohalian and John Sears. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. It is a pleasure. It is an honor. It is a privilege to be back at Books and Books here in Coral Gables. I see a lot of independent bookstores around the country, and this is a gem. Books and Books is one of the world-class bookstores, so a big shout-out to everyone here at this wonderful world of books. Thank you so much for having us. And I want to thank all of you for joining us on this exquisitely beautiful Coral Gables Friday night. You really are the medieval monks of the digital age, because you still care about what words and reading and books can mean to the soul. And I can't tell you what an honor it is for me to introduce John Searles. John is a great friend and an immensely gifted novelist. Many of you might know him from his two previous books, Boy Still Milt Missing, um, Strange But True. Many of you might know him from his appearances on the Today Show. Many of you might know him from the early show, from his weekly broadcast on Cosmo Radio on Sirius. And many of you might know him as the mind behind all of those wonderful headlines on the Cosmopolitan covers that we love to read whenever we are getting our issues of Cosmopolitan magazine, Fun, Fearless, and Female. Um, I know John, however, on a more personal level, and it speaks to not merely what a gifted novelist he is, and when you read Help for the Haunted, you will see that I am not overselling this book. It is spectacular, but what a huge, wonderful heart he has. I receive a lot of books to blurb, and about 13 years ago, an editor sent me a book to read called Boy Still Missing, and for whatever the reason, I actually read this particular manuscript and I was unprepared for how poignant and powerful it was going to be. So indeed, I did blurb, Boy Still Missing. Now, of all of the books that I have blurbed over the last 13 years, only one time, one time, has an author done more to thank me other than sending me a text or an email like saying, thanks, I knew it was a good book and you'd like it. It was John. John heard from his editor that this guy he'd never met in northern Vermont had read Boys Still Missing and was saying really nice things about it, and he happened to be vacationing in Key West. So what did he do? Two days later, arriving at my house in the land of the polar tomato, the frozen tundra of northern New England, arrived two um, um, key lime pies, <laughs> fresh and dry ice, from Key West. It is the best thanks I have ever gotten for doing a good deed ever, and John and I have been friends ever since. Thank God I didn't send him, like, I don't know, a cookie or something. I don't know. <laughs> Even a cookie would have been better than a text. Um, so imagine this is the situation. You're a teenage girl. You've got an older sister who's now, you know, consenting adult. And suddenly and horrifically, you are orphaned. And you are living in a house that may or may not be haunted. It's the end of a block. 
And in your basement are the remnants of what your mother and father did for a living before they were horrifically killed. And what do they do for a living? Well, they provided help for the haunted. And haunted is both a literal and a metaphoric verb in this absolutely remarkable novel that is part coming of age story, part ghost story, part mystery. I loved every single page of Help for the Haunted, um, but now I think I, I should probably turn it over a little bit to John. What we're going to do tonight is I'm going to ask John some questions, pretend I'm Dick Cavett, he's John Lennon, <laughs> and then I'm going to turn it over to you for your questions about anything. Um, and, and the one thing you need to know is John does not know what I am going to ask him. We've not had these questions vetted by any producer um, on, you know, on, on the Colbert Report. <laughs> so that's a, so um, the first question I think I would love to ask you is, tell me about the inspiration for Help for the Haunted. Why did you decide to write this particular novel? Well, first, thank you, Books and Books, for having us. And Chris, thank you for that amazing introduction. And I'm so glad I sent you a key lime pie. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, you know, I've always been obsessed with sort of haunted, weird, paranormal things. And when I was a kid, my mom's, two of my mom's friends, one used to come over and she would tell this doozy of a ghost story about when she was a bookkeeper in the Air Force. She and her friend met this soldier and he claimed he was a ghost and he proved it, but he said, I will prove it to you. And they drove out to this empty airfield and he stepped in front of the car and disappeared before their eyes. And my mother used to say, oh yeah, but how many, after how many glasses of wine did this happen? <laughs> so, and then another friend of my mother's used to come to babysit us packing a Ouija board, <laughs> as one does. And uh, she would like pop popcorn and we'd watch monster movies and that thing would go whizzing around the Ouija board and she would tell us about like spirits who contacted her from the dead and the, oh the other night I woke up and the ghost of I don't know Sally was at the foot of my bed and so I just always had a fascination but I never had a ghost story of my own so I don't know I've just been always curious about that because I think I'm such a skeptic but I would really like to believe in that sort of thing so I think that's how I put Sylvie, this character, in this situation. Of, and I kept everything grounded in reality, but it tipped out up to the edge of what's possible and what's believable in terms of the paranormal. And I've, I don't know, it's just my own fascination. I always love to scare people, too. Like, even when I, when I was little, I used to build haunted houses in my family's garage and then charge kids in the neighborhood 25 cents to come in. And I had this Disney record that was like, whoa, and I would, that would be like my favorite record to play. And then when I got my station, when I was older, for my paper route, I saved money and I fixed up my family station wagon. And I, my idea of fun on like a Saturday night would be to load like 12 of my friends in my family station wagon, drive them down this dirt road in our town. And then I would turn off the car, take the keys and run off in the woods and just to see what they did. <laughs> and they'd be like, Johnny, come back. And I thought that was really entertaining. So I always had this fascination with fear and scaring people and paranormal things and stuff like that. So I guess that's where the inspiration came from. Tell readers about Sylvie and Sylvie's situation and, and what her parents do for a living. Well, um, so Sylvie's the narrator. She's a teenage girl. And everyone always says to me, how did you write the point of view of a teenage girl? And I always say, well, deep down, I am a teenage girl. So it all makes <laughs> sense to me. But um, seriously, to that end, it's like I grew up, my dad was a cross-country truck driver. And so he was gone much of the time. My brother was around, but he was off, so off with working or he had this car he used to work on all the time. And so it was really, we, it was a small house and I was always with my mom and my two sisters. So it was always around women. And then later, you know, in school, I, well, I was kind of bullied a lot. And so I, most of my friends with the girls because I didn't really, I wasn't very athletic. I didn't fit in with the boys. And then later in, after I graduated college, I went on to become an editor at this huge, massive women's magazine for 17 years. So I would say I have a sense of women by now. <laughs> So writing this point of view of this teenage girl, I don't know, I just had the idea of this girl who was left in the care of her older sister, Rose, and Rose is not so nice to her. And I was writing this book, and I just, um, the opening scene, it's a, it opens with a late night phone call. And that's how I open Strange But True as well, because I feel like what better way to open a book than a late night phone call, because whose phone has not rang in the middle of the night, like, night and you're like, what the hell is this? What's going to happen? And so... It's a snowy winter night, and we find out right away her parents have this unusual occupation and that people are always calling the house late at night. And in this case, they're lured to a church in town by their older sister, Rose, who's been estranged from the family for some time, by Sylvie's older sister. And so they go off to the church, and first the father goes in, and then the mother, and at the end of the first chapter, 
Sylvie wakes, she falls asleep in the back of the car, and she wakes to the sound of gunfire, and so she goes up to the door of the church, and she's about to enter, and that's when the chapter ends. And from that point on, the book flashes back and forth in time from the years leading up to the murder to the months following. So it's very much a combination of things. It's part murder mystery in some way. It's part coming-of-age story, part family drama, and it was the hardest thing I ever had to do. I, I'm going to go back to waiting tables because <laughs> I was waiting for 12 long years and it was really hard. It made my head hurt sometimes to sort of put all the elements together. But Sylvie's mother and father. Um, we, uh, and this is not going to spoil anything that, that you know, you're go it's not going to spoil the book for you. Sylvie's mother and father die in the opening pages of the book. How are they killed? Well, they're murdered. They're shot inside this church, and but Sylvie's the only witness to this thing that's happened. But it's she's just woken up. It's late. It's dark. She goes inside the church, and she doesn't really clearly remember who she she saw. So she points the finger at the person who everybody thinks it is, and that's part of the story of the book. Is um, who is the person who did it? Is it this person who's now waiting for trial behind bars that she's pointed the finger at, or is it someone else? And again, I'm making it sound like a murder mystery and it is in some ways but it's also part ghost story part coming of age and all it's a lot of different things um at once so anyway your most re your, your previous book strange but true was published nine years ago um why bring that up. yeah no no but i mean strange but true is another wonderful book and again you know a, a lot of it some of the characters in it are teenagers boy still missing it's a teenager um sylvie's one of the most authentic teenage voices I've read in literature in a lot of years. Um, why do you think that that twilight zone of adolescence, and I use the word twilight lowercase t, not uppercase t, um, is sort of your literary sweet spot? Well, I think those were such formative years. Well, they are for everybody, but in my own experience, they were for me. Um, and I think I was put into a lot of situations as a kid that were maybe beyond my grasp or what I should have been dealing with at the time and so I just it really resonates with me putting a younger person in a situation I mean here Sylvie is like she's lost her parents she's trying to figure out who killed them and she's just caught in this whirlwind of circumstance trying to put it together I also think you know I had a, a younger sister who passed away really suddenly and tragically and my youngest sister I uh, sort after uh, two younger sisters and uh, um, the one who's youngest in age, who's li alive and well at the time, she was the age of Sylvie. And so after my sister died, my parents divorced, my brother and I left home, I moved to New York to try to become a writer, and she was there by herself, and I would go home on the weekends to wait tables. Like, I did the reverse, there are a million restaurants in Manhattan, but I kept my restaurant job at home and would com reverse commute. I'd go to NYU during the weekend, go home, in part because I had great shifts and customers I loved, but also to be able to spend time with my mom and my sister. And so I remember going home and she would just be there by herself and I would think she's so young to be faced with such an enormous loss. But my sister showed such a res remarkably resilient spirit and a sense of pluck. And um, I don't know, I think I was channeling some bit of my sister when I was creating this character of Sylvie who's the age when she's faced with such loss as well. So. There's a doll in this book. And it's not a doll like Chucky. It's infinitely scarier. Can you talk a little bit about the doll and how the doll figures into Sylvie's parents' life? Well, yeah, everyone now keeps tweeting me and emailing me pictures of their doll. So every time I turn to my cell, I'm like, ah, <laughs> like, yes, there's some spooky, creepy doll staring at me. But uh, yeah, I, my mom, I went up in the attic of my mom's house like a few years ago and I, I don't know what I was looking for Christmas decorations I can't remember but I opened a garbage bag and there was all this red yarn and I was like what is it and I pulled it out and it was attached to a head and like a toddler size rat doll so after I scream and peed my pants I was like oh yeah I remember this it was a raggedy Ann and Andy they were do you guys remember in like the 70s or 80s this was like a trend they she made them I think she bought them at like a department store like a mail order kit or something and she put them together and they used to sit on a rocking chair in our living room and they used to scare the hell out of me. You remember my cousins are here tonight and they remember those. Your mom probably had them too. And so I don't know after that experience like it actually truly startled me in the attic and I said to my mom like those things are still up there in the attic. Those <laughs> dolls. <laughs> and so whenever I would go home I would just think of them up there and I would just think just even their presence that's it. And the thing is I... There are these books like, you know, where people, Chucky, where suddenly the doll's chasing everyone around, or other vampire stories where people have fangs, or people are moving things with their mind, and 
uh, there's nothing wrong with those kind of books. But to me at this point, like as soon as something goes into that sort of territory, I think it's almost less scary because you're like, oh, I, I've been here before. I know what this is. But so in this book, I thought, well, I'll just put this doll in a cage in the basement. And that's going to be enough to like really scare people. Like, why is it in a cage? What's it doing down there? And so um, that's part of the question of the novel is like, why, why do the parents have this doll in a cage in the basement? And it scares the hell out of Sylvie too. And then, yeah. <laughs> and after the parents are gone, but something the townspeople do is they come by as a joke and they throw rag dolls on their front lawn. So they're often coming home at night and finding them. And it's like, it just adds to the whole, listen, I went creepy this time, everybody. So get ready. Yeah. yeah okay, you went creepy this time. Have you ever actually been a ghost hunter yourself or, or spent any time around ghosts? Well, I recently did a story for a big newspaper that you'll see in like a month. Uh, it'll be out in a few weeks where I, you know, because I'm doing this book, all this haunted, all this haunted stuff's on my mind. And recently someone sent me, this is a little aside, someone sent me a thing where they said, um, Mr. Searles, I see the media attention you're getting for your book, Help for the Haunted. I wanted to interest you in a similar title, The Haunted Vagina. <laughs> and the tagline is, it's hard to love a woman when her private parts are a gateway to hell. <laughs> I was like, it was so weird. I was like, yeah, same thing. Anyway, <laughs> okay. I think I dated that woman once. No. Uh, so I, but I, I called my editor at this newspaper, a newspaper, and I said, I really want to do a travel piece on um, haunted things. And I was like, here, she, okay, what are your ideas? I said, one idea is like the other sort of ha secondary haunted cities of America, because everybody always thinks of Savannah and New Orleans as the haunted spots. She's like, okay, I like that. That's interesting. What's your other idea? Said, the other one is there's this insane asylum in what, the mountains of West Virginia, and it's closed now, and I could go like maybe sleep over there. She's like, that's what you're doing. That's the one you're doing. So two weeks ago, off I went and spent a night in this formerly haunted, or now haunted, but former insane asylum. It was like I was in a Scooby-Doo episode all night. That's all I could say. I mean, it was fascinating and strange and, um, you know, well, the funny thing is, like, th I wanted to bring someone, and so I, I had asked Thomas, like, do you want to come with me? And he said, um, no, find some other sucker. So I was like, that's okay. I, kn I know who I'll ask. I'll ask Oscar, my Costa Rican personal trainer, because he often, he's always telling me about ghosty scenes. Like, sometimes I'm doing, like, squats in my living room because he comes over to work out with me, and he'll be like, ooh. And I'm like, what? what? He's like, I just saw a ghost walk into your bedroom. Like, he just sees ghosts all the time. So I'm like, who else better to protect me or cling to should things get ugly? So Oscar unfortunately had a Zumba convention that interfered with my quest. <laughs> oh damn! So I w um I ticked down a long roster of friends who every time like, listen, I have this great idea. Next weekend, do you want to go to an insane asylum? It's closed and sleep over. And everyone was like, no, effing way, not happening. So I said to Thomas, well, will you come with me? And he agreed. And he said, and his dad um was an altar boy at the Vatican, so he was really Catholic. And, uh, um, so uh, he said, uh, yes, but I'm bringing a Bible and a cross, and we couldn't find one in our apartment. So I was like, don't worry. Um, I Googled there's a Walmart near one. We'll pick one up there. <laughs> so we went to the Walmart near the insane asylum, and um, we were, there was not a Bible to be found in the book section that we could see. So I was like, there's a Jackie Collins novel. You could read that all night. But so um, there were uh, racks of guns. I go, we could buy a gun to protect us. He was not finding any of this funny. So we bought cots and sleeping bags and all our stuff, and off we went to the insane asylum. And I, when I had first called the place, I said to the woman, like, what are my best chances if I come of seeing a ghost? And she said, oh, that's easy, the 9 to 5 tour. And I was like, well, that sounds like a temp job. And she was like, no, 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 the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., where you go in and you get assigned a ghost hunter. And these people are serious about this. And people go like once a month. People are regulars to go. And you get assigned a you ghost hunter and you break up into groups and you explore the different wards of the asylum. And I was like, okay, that sounds good because I've always wanted my own ghost story. So I was like really into it. Like, okay, that sounds great. I said, but what if I really wanted to guarantee seeing a ghost? And she was thinking about it. I said, okay, let me just get out with my idea. I want to sleep over in the scariest part of the asylum. And she was like, okay, let me tell you that's, an extreme request, and you better have some balls, but that would be the former uh, lobotomy recovery room where no one goes, it's off limits, there's no electricity, there's no running water, and some bad things happen there. I was like, perfect, can't wait. <laughs> so excited. So Thomas and I drive up, and he keeps going like this. I'm like, you're like an old nun. Stop making the sign of cross. <laughs> and so um, Copperhead, our tour guide, who is a sweet guy with long red hair and tattoos up his arms, he was our tour guide for the night, and he led us around. And what's interesting is, like, they have 
these rooms with like mountains of cigarettes in them. And I was like, what are the cigarettes for? And they're like, they're offerings for the ghost to lure them out. Has anyone ever done anything like this? Am I talking like a foreign language? Are you all staring at me like, where he's gone off the deep end? But so I'm like, wait, so the ghost is going to reach out and just grab a cigarette and like take a puff of a Marlboro Light? Like, <laughs> it just seems so strange to me. But it's like, well, they were in, when they were here, the patients loved to smoke. And so it's one way they lure them out. So we're in this dark room in Copperhead. I always thought like the way you would talk to a ghost would be some special like voodoo language. Instead, he was talking to the ghost like the way you would like a bratty teenager who had slammed his slammed her door and run into her room. He's like, Eddie, I know you're mad at me. Come on out. And then when that didn't work, there was like w there were four of us guys in the group and one woman. And he's like, I know you like the ladies. We're here with a pretty girl. And like this poor she's in the dark you being used as ghost bait. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, Amy, do you feel vulnerable right now? But the thing is about Amy, she was so brave, braver than the rest of us. She's like had her eye on this pair of purple boots that some nurse must have owned 30 years ago in an abandoned kitchen. She's like, I want those boots. And I was like, they probably belong to a haunted nurse. She was like, even better. So she like was shoplifting the asylum. So anyway, we left in the middle of the night because Thomas could not take it anymore. We heard weird noises. Thomas was like, I refuse to stay here. I'll send you guys a link if you want when the article comes out, which explains the whole story. But have they been ghost hunting? Thomas directed Ghost. Yeah, Thomas is a theater director, and he directed Ghost, the 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 National Tour of Ghost, the musical that's just running. So he, so it is funny. He was working on Ghost, and I was working on my own sort of Ghost stuff. But I had so that was my experience, and I was I left thinking like, well, I don't really have a Ghost story. Well, maybe I sort of do, but I've never really come face to face with a Ghost. And so everybody I asked when I was going on the trip, so many people said to me like, I wouldn't do that. I saw a Ghost. Like so many people have a story of seeing a Ghost. I don't have one until. I don't know, Amy and Copperhead, I guess that's my ghost story now, I don't know. <laughs> You're a, a great storyteller. Were, were, you one of the, were you one of those kids who was always writing when you were you know, in middle school and in high school? Well, I used to make these books um, out of, and I put this in Help for the Haunted, actually. Uh, my mom, you'll see when you read, if you read it, um, these wallpaper swatch books my mom had, and I used to pick out my favorite wallpaper patterns, and they always had these funny names, like, or like, or, you know, I don't know, like the Keep Calm or the Sunny Day, or they had these very sweet names and some kind of quirky names. And I would pick them out and I would glue them to cardboard and bind them with duct tape and fill them with construction paper and then fill them with stories and try to sell them to my family. And like my first story was like Over the Rainbow, sending a little message there. Um, <laughs> my second story is Behind the Rainbow, sending another message. And um, I would then s write them and then sell them to my family. So I was both a writer and a publisher from an early age. And I always wrote, but then when I got into high school, it wasn't so cool really to be writing poems and short stories. And so I really put it aside, but I used to go to the town library all the time, which is why I'm such a fan of libraries because I used to go and I would just do everything there. Like I taught myself how to read tarot cards. And so I used to read like cards for people all the time. And I don't really claim any psychic ability. And then years later, my professor in graduate school kind of retaught me how to read them. And, um, I don't know, I just read tons of books and I was always writing, but I took a break. And then when my sister died was when I realized life is short and I wanted to pursue my dream of being a writer. And that's when I finished up at a state college and applied to NYU. And I got a scholarship to NYU, but I always joke it's like a sale at like Bergdorf's where it's so expensive that even if they mark it down, it's still really expensive. So I had my waitering job, I had like a million jobs. I never had any money, but I just sort of made it, made do with it. And funny thing is by year 12 of waiting tables, like. As I said, I used to go reverse commute up to Connecticut and I would work Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, and I was so burnt out on it by the end. And I Sunday nights, if you didn't catch the ten twenty train, the next train was something like twelve forty and they called it like the mail train or the milk train or something like that. And it it took hours. So you didn't get to Grand Central till like two forty and then you didn't I didn't get home to my apartment in the village till like three thirty. So you wanted that train. And I remember there was one snowy February night and it was like two minutes to ten. And uh I had all the chairs up. Anyone who's over waiting tables will relate to the story. I had all the chairs up. I'm ready to bolt for the train. And in walks this woman and two, ma two men. And the manager says, you have to seat them. And I was like, oh. So I go up to the table. I'm like, can I take your order? And the woman looks at me. She goes, smile. And I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'll be right back. <laughs> so I went in the bathroom. And I 
um, composed myself and came back and I was like, okay, what can I get you? And they were like, oh, the hamburger, please. They were so like scared of me at that point. But anyway, by year 12, I was so ready. To, I couldn't do the waitering thing anymore. Like I, I loved it when I loved it. I had great friends. I made so much money. It was such a blessing. But after 12 years, I was ready to move on. And I had this dream of being a writer. And I didn't even tell a lot of people that I wanted to be a writer. But I, um, yeah, I don't know. I have a, a friend whose first novel, as far as most of the world is concerned, is actually his seventh novel. He wrote six novels that he never was able to sell. Um, Boy Still Missing for most of the world is your first novel. Did you have a novel before that one? I did when I was in graduate school at NYU. I wrote this really autobiogra autobiographical novel called Stones in the Airfield, and because um, where where my sister passed away, where she was, is buried, it used to be an old airfield in our town, as my cousins will remember, and it was turned into a cemetery, oddly. And so when she was buried there, there were probably like six graves there. there were, and so it was just this empty old airfield, and it was up the street from her house, and we would just go there very casually, almost every day, to like be with her. And so I wrote this book up sort of with that in it, and I sent it off to many agents and got a ton of rejections, as every writer does, but then I, sent it to a friend of a friend of a friend who worked at a publishing house who said, you don't need an agent, just send it to me directly. And so I sent it to her, and then like a couple months later, I get a note back, uh, or the manuscript back, and I take it out, and there's a very uh, polite two steps away from a form letter, like, Mr. Searles, thanks for sending your novel. I didn't connect to the characters as much as I hoped to. Best of luck. Fine. But then I take the manuscript out, and this little scrap of paper drifts to the floor. It was clearly not meant for my eyes. It was an in-house thing, and it said, I could barely make it to page 60, and I feel really sorry for anyone who has to read the whole thing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was very, like, Downton Abbey about it. I took to my bed. I was, like, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I'll never write again. And then weirdly, I... Um, I don't know how long went by, but a, a while, a very long time. I start, I heard it was cleaning under my bed, and I heard the first sentence to Boy Still Missing, which is whenever my father disappeared, we looked for him on Hanover Street. And I thought, well, let me write that down. and I'll just do it as a hobby, as I've always done. So I wrote it down, and then I heard the second sentence, and I went and wrote that down, and I kept doing it. In the meantime, I had got an agent at that point, and she ca she's the sweetest woman in the world. She has like, a very high voice, and she would call me, I know you're writing something. And so I, one day she called and I said, well, I'll send you something. And unlike that first book that was rejected universally with that nasty letter, this book she sold, I only had like six chapters done, and she sold it in like two weeks just based on that. So it was a very opposite experience of that first time. So. Not that the world needs another Devil Wears Prada, which I liked very much, book in the movie, but is there a novel gestating inside you uh, based on your experiences in Cosmopolitan? Yeah, there have been a lot. <laughs> yes, that'll be my answer. Um, at some point, yeah. I mean, it'll have to, there have been so many funny things that have happened and wacky, kooky things and wonderful things, crazy things, like just... It's such a fascinating place to work, and I've been there now. So my first day on the job was the day of the O.J. Simpson verdict, so you all remember, that was many years ago. And you know, imagine you're me, and like you grew up, and your dad's a truck driver, and I, like, I worked these like crazy other jobs, and then suddenly you land, and you're like cosmopolitan. It was so weird. And they hired me, like I remember my professor said, I was going in the interview, and I, I was like, should I bring a resume? And she said to me, well, you're a writer. You don't need a resume. So then when they were interviewing me, they're like, well, where's your resume? And I kept going, I'm a writer. I don't have a resume. <laughs> and then I swear they just, I bought a jacket from the Salvation Army at $12 for $12, which is not a good idea to go in an interview at a fashion magazine. I think they just hired me because they felt sorry for me. But um, the first day on the job was the day of the O.J. Simpson verdict. And Helen Gurley Brown was so frugal, a lovely woman, very frugal. She only had one TV in the office in the entire office, and it was in her office. And so we all marched down there at one o'clock to watch the verdict. And so I remember I'd never seen her before. And there she is at the age of like 78, and her hair is teased. She's got a plunging like leather tube top on or something and like a short skirt. And at the age of 78, she had just had her breast done recently. And everyone else was staring at the TV. And I remember I was like, I was staring at Helen, like, <laughs> like, and, so, yeah, there are a lot of stories, I guess. And at some point, I will write them all down. I did write a piece for the Washington Post about like my life as a Cosmo boy when Helen retired and some of the wacky things that have happened there. It's, it's such a great place to work, and it's filled with so many smart women, but also a lot of colorful characters, too. So. Now I'd love to turn it over to all of you for any of your questions about anything. And the first question is always the hardest for you and for John. Wendy, oh, and we'll repeat the question. Speaking through, 
but they will hear you on the internet. So, who has a question? Uh, my daughter is studying at uh, Savannah College of Art and Design, one of the most haunted cities in America, um, and she's studying dramatic writing. She just declared her major. She's a sophomore, and she's been told by a number of people that have been, um, we've got some familiarity in the family with the television director, movie director, that sort of thing, and they tell her to write what you know. So do you find that when you're writing, a lot of your experiences come in to different parts of your characters? And maybe a name of a street that you lived on is the name that you chose for that. My cousins are giving me that. very knowing looks in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I always joke that my mom thinks she's every mom in every book. Like the first book, she's like, why'd you make me such a whore? And I'm like, it's not you, mom. It's not <laughs> I love her. But um, let's see. Yeah, uh, you know, there are always details. But I always twist them around in my imagination, so they're never exactly the same. And I do make up a ton of stuff, too. But in this book... In particular, I used some last names of people from high school just for fun so they recognize themselves. There used to be this foundation by the library where my brother and I went to. W it was a foundation of a house that was started and never built. And uh, my brother and I, w on occasion, would go there and play or in other neighborhood kids. And it was just abandoned. And I used to wonder all the time, like, well, who started this house and why is it here and whatever happened? And so when I wrote this book, I gave that they live on a street of all these abandoned foundations. They're the only house on the street. It's like a development that was started and no one ever built homes. And it's sort of like a, it gives their street, an, in case things aren't creepy enough in this book, it makes it even creepier. Uh, but I definitely use things, um, the little wallpaper swatches that I said was something very much from my own life. Um, I know I talk about this a lot. Like when I was writing this book, it was about you know two sisters whose parents were murdered and you know, it's from the point of the view of the younger sister. I didn't really have a clear identity for the parents, um, but I, my town library invited me back for this unveiling of this quilt that they made, and it, it looked like it looks like a bookshelf, and if you were a writer from the town, your name was on the spine of the book. And so at this point in my life, with Cosmo and the Today Show and all my fun stuff I get to do, like I've done lots of great stuff, but going back to my town library was like the biggest, biggest deal for me, and I invited my whole family and friends. So I go to the unveiling, and... Um, there was a guy who wrote a crossword puzzle book there from the town, a woman who wrote some lovely young adult novels, me, and then this woman, Lorraine Warren. Have you ever heard of her? They were there. Did you hear the movie The Conjuring this summer? It was number one at the box office, like a horror movie. Well, I had forgotten about them, and I never really knew much about them growing up, but they were these famous, semi-famous demonologists in my town. She was there. So she was there standing next to me, and I was thinking standing next to her, how when I would run into her in the store, we lived behind a grocery store and we'd go there to like steal candy and stuff and you'd round the corner and there she would be like pushing her carriage. Like, ah! She's like, because everyone knew they like did weird hocus pocus stuff with the devil. And so I didn't know that much about him, but I just remembered like how she would scare the crap out of me as a kid. And I thought, what would it be like if you were the child of someone who's parents had this unusual occupation and I very much didn't want to write their stories. I purposely didn't even research anything about them but I use that as a jumping off point to create my own characters and um, and give Sylvie's parents an occupation dealing with the paranormal and helping haunted souls. And then it, my imagination just ran with me. And then one other thing from real life was that I, or there are many things, but one is two, I had this job as a telemarketer growing in high school where I would call and do these phone surveys like on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate bubble yum in terms of its chewability? Like really hardcore questions like that. And then I also, um, went away to Yotto, a writer's colony, and they put me in this old Tudor house in the woods. And as soon as I was there, I was like, this is going to be the house of my book. And so I, the how, while I lived up there at this artist colony in this old Tudor house, I just took that house and twisted it. It's not exactly the same as it is in real life, but I used it as inspiration for the house of my book. Anyone else have a question for me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, qu the question. Okay, the question is about why do you think the sec the other book that sold itself within the first six chapters, even though it was not ready, was so much more appealing than the first book that uh, gave you that nasty note? That's a really good question. So why do I think that the second book, Boy Still Missing, my second written book, my first published one, sold so much? faster and sold at all than the first book. I think because I really learned a lesson as harsh as that l rejection letter was that I found that was not meant for my eyes. It taught me this lesson of like the value of keeping or the reader entertained. And I think I was probably in that first book really writing 
being a bit self-indulgent and spending a lot of time just writing for myself without thinking there's someone on the other end of this transmission who you're kind of feeding a story to. And so I really learned, and I try to do this now with all my books since, with Boys Don't Missing Exchange, but you're now with Help for the Haunted, of immediately creating a question in the reader's mind. And in the case of Help for the Haunted, it's that phone ringing in the middle of the night. It's going to the church and what's going to be there. It's what happened the parents, why aren't they coming out? It's creating questions right away that they want to keep turning the pages to find the answers. And so... I've always aimed to do that now. And because of that, as horrible as that letter was, it was probably the best thing that happened, one of the best things that happened to me as a writer because I, I'm always mindful of that now. And I don't think in that first book, I haven't gone back to look at it in years. But if I did, I probably would realize like, great, that person was right. <laughs> it was not that good. So that's the answer to your question. Good question. I think it's a good question, yeah. Anyone else have a question? Oh, Andrew, Sarah's brother. He'll sign Sarah's books for her. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize we could do that. I mean, I, I have a brother and a sister. We could set, uh, can, can cousins count? Can I send them on the road for me too? <laughs> John, I have a quick question. Hey there. <laughs> nice hey, to see you. How are you? Oh, nice, nice to, to see, see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Yeah, oh, yeah. Nice. Great to see you. Your author photograph with all those typewriters. Oh, yeah. What happened to him? Well, what's funny is that my niece, when she saw my niece, everyone who knows knows me from growing up or close friends all call me Johnny, but my niece calls me Nani and because when she was little, she couldn't pronounce it. And she said, Nani, what are you doing in front of those junked up computers? And I said, they're typewriters. She said, what's that? <laughs> Like, she didn't know what they were. But weirdly, it was actually an art installation. And I was walking along and I was like, oh, look at all these typewriters. And I just like sat in front of it. Someone took one picture of me. And then later, when they needed an author photo, I was just like digging around for something. And, and I just thought, oh, this would be fun. And I was like, oh, would you guys want this? And they were like, oh, we love it. And it, it just sort of came about. It was, it seems like I would have planned that, but I didn't. It just sort of happened. I yeah. It was a, a Today Show story of some sort. No. Where was the installation? The south of France. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was on vacation somewhere, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you for asking about that. Everyone does ask about those typewriters. They're like, where did they come from? But um, yeah. Anybody else have a question? Well, I thank you all for coming. I hope you check out Help for the Haunted. It's been really nice to meet so many of you and answer your questions. And I'll see you around. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Books and Books. Mitch, thank you. I got to thank Chris Bojalian, who, first of all, yesterday got up at 3.26 in the morning in Vermont to fly south to do an event with me, which is great. So he's a great fellow writer, a dear, dear friend to do this, to help me out here, because it has, he pointed out, it's been nine years since my last book. And also, Books and Books, I haven't seen Mitch in so long, but it's great to see you again and nice to be here. So thank you very much. And folks, as I said earlier, don't forget, we have the books out for sale. The, both gentlemen will be signing them for you right here. If you're at home watching, call the number on the screen below, and uh, we'll get a book signed for you and ship it to you. Or as I said before, I'll drive it to, my to your house myself. Stick around. we got some live music coming up, beer and wine in the courtyard, great cafe. Enjoy yourselves this evening. Thanks for coming. <laughs>